God. Okay, it's wonderful to be here again, and welcome to everyone who is with us this morning. In Jesus' mighty name, shalom, and God bless you also to our um, church members that I had to reach out to because we had a storm last night, but the Spirit of God has been ministering to me, and he's given me very vivid, vivid, vivid dreams, and also very, very strict and urgent word. As you can see from the title, it says an urgent word to the pastors of America and United Kingdom. Amen. So this is what I am here to do right now. Good morning, everyone. Good to see you all. It's a blessing to be in the presence of God and to worship the Lord with you in Jesus name. Amen. I would ask that you would share it out. I would ask that you would think about and hear what the Spirit of God is saying and why he's focusing specifically on the ministers, on the pastors of America and United Kingdom. However, it is also a word to every Christian. It is a word to every believer. And so I don't want you to think it's not a word to you. I want you to say, this is a word to me. As long as I'm a believer, this is a word to me. This is also a clarion call for the saints of God to pray. This is a clarion call for the people of God to pray. Amen. Because we are in urgent days and we have literally days and weeks. And when I say weeks, I would say less than eight weeks. I would literally say less than, I would even say less than a month. The way the Lord put it in my spirit is literally less than a month. But by June, there must be changes. By June, there must be changes. People of God, amen. For those who will hear this word, may the Lord, amen, just give you the grace to accept it and to know what to do and how to act in order to, um, I would say, to derail what the hand of the Lord is getting ready to do. And it will not be pleasant for those who do not hear. However, for those who are walking in the will of God, you are protected and you are covered by his grace and by his mercy. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. Okay, so as I've already prayed, um, for those of you who don't know me, maybe, my name is Apostle Vivian Rose Odelay. Praise the Lord. I'm the visionary founder of the Two Shall Be One Ministries. And here with the church, together with my husband, Union City Church family, we planted it, I believe, last year. We actually planted it 2021. And then things didn't really go right. Um, and then we kind of went online. And then we replanted it earlier on last year. Okay, late on last year late on last year. Now, all of this has come as a result of encounters. Amazingly, we've been praying on the Gideon Warren for the saints of God, especially for men to have holy encounters with the true and the living God. And it's amazing that as we prayed that for them, God has brought it to our front door. Amen. He's brought it to my front door. And he began to speak to me um, very much after we had the April fast. Now we have ready bright fast, which is preparing the saints of God to become ready brides, male and female, to become ready brides, especially for union and for marriage and for revival, amen, and for the coming of the Lord. So after the April fast, the Spirit of God literally, um, let me just open up. I've got it all written down here, so let me just open it up now. That literally the next day, I believe, or the day after, when I was just you know, resting. And I always ask the Lord and pray after every fast, after we've, um, you know, completed the assignment that he's given us. I always ask him that, Lord, I hope it was carried out in a way that pleased you because he's the one that instructs us when to fast. He also instructs and guides the words that are um, released during those fasts. Amen. And so in my spirit, I felt at peace with what had happened. However, the next day, the Lord began to speak to me and I could feel grief. I could feel grief. And so I was wondering, why am I feeling grief? And it came as a surprise because I was expecting to feel the, the joy of God. I was expecting to feel more of the completion joy that you get when you obey the Lord. Amen. Praise God. So when I felt the grief, I asked the Lord, what is wrong? What is wrong? I hope you can hear me. Let me just put this in. Okay, because sometimes I know it can go a bit funny. I hope you can hear me. Is everything okay? Okay. It's, it's fine, all right? All right, no problem. Okay, praise God. Thank you. So I began to ask the Spirit of God that what was wrong? Because I could feel the Spirit of God was grieving in me and was grieving through me. And so I began to inquire of the Lord, what's wrong? What is wrong? And then he let me know at that time that he was grieved with how many in his body were suffering and were about to suffer. 
And then he began to take me to the scriptures, which I'm going to speak to you. Now, remember, this is the word to pastors of America and United Kingdom. And the Lord has raised me in ministry in United Kingdom. And then later on, he brought us over to minister to um, the saints in United States. And because now he has planted the church in United States, he's begun to give me words specifically for the church in America. Okay, praise God. So he let me know that he was pleased with us. He let me know he was pleased with those who honored him, but is very hurt over the numbers of people who are going to be affected by the coming events in the church due to disobedience and complacency. He then began to grieve through me about his sadness. He began to grieve through me about the things that he's about to do because he's been pushed to the wall and also the things that people are going to suffer as a result of these things, if there is no repentance, amen? Complacency among women who he desired to become intercessors, not only for union and marriage, but for men. Complacency among women who have not given their wombs over to become intercessors even for revival and for their nations and for the youth. This was the, the number thing, number two thing. And also they have failed to permit him. And he brought this back again when I was driving with my daughter. They have failed to permit him to use their life as intercessors to birth out his purposes. Because his purposes on the earth cannot happen without prayer. And because of the urgency of the hour, there should have been a greater demand. There should have been a greater response to the call to pray for men, for youth, for marriage, and for revival, which means praying for the nation. And many women are the ones who have been appointed in this generation to be those voices and to be those people, and they have not agreed to that. They have asked God for what they desire, but they have not committed themselves to the work and to the sacrifice of laying down their lives to become intercessors. They've withdrawn their agreement. They've withdrawn their sacrifice, all right? That was an area. Then compromise, compromise among ministers who by practicing immorality and unethical ways of leading his people for private gain. And so complacency, amen, and compromise were the two words that has, he has brought to mind, complacency and compromise. So if you're in any of those two categories, there needs to be a repentance. You have to go before God in repentance. We cannot continue to um, justify our ways or justify our pain or justify our feelings before God when we have not submitted to his counsel and submitted to his call and submitted to his ways. Jesus will always look for a man. The Bible says that when there was unrighteousness in the earth, he was marveled because there was no man and there was no intercessor. He always looks for a man to stand in the gap. And that is a man or a woman. Amen. And in this generation, he's called the women to be part and parcel of the army effort as intercessors. Praise God. Okay. He then took me to the book of Jeremiah and Ezekiel. Now, I've been in this book of Jeremiah and Ezekiel for months. I came into the new year in the book of Jeremiah and Ezekiel. And the Spirit of God in giving me the word, this is the year of the bride and of divine settlement. He began to show me that his bride will become consecrated even as the bride of Christ. He began to show me that his bride will be settled and be recompensed for what she's had to go through as a consequence, all right, of many other people's disobedience um, over the years and in the body of Christ. But this is the year of the Lord, because it is the Hebraic year, 5784 of the door, that he will settle the issue of union. He will settle the issue of marriage, restoration. He will also settle the issue financially, and he will settle and restore years that the locust has eaten in the lives of the individuals who are seeking him and serving him, okay? That was the word. But he also let me know that because of the false prophets, and because of the pollution and the contamination in the house of God, because of people that have picked up and are prophesying words, he has not given them. And are speaking or preaching or teaching in areas, he has not sent them. That he will bring a separation. He will bring a divide. He will bring exposure to the error of what is going on. And he will reconsecrate the pastorate. And he will reconsecrate the leadership. And that is all part of the word the year of the bride that was given in the beginning of the year on the two shall be one platform. I believe it's also here in Union City Church platform as well. You can look back to it, okay? So that's all part of the year. So usually he doesn't allow me to call names, but this year in specifically, at certain times he's shown me certain people over the last two, three years, amen, 
He showed me certain people and showed me certain names and made me understand some of them are in the house of God. Some of them are in the world. However, they have been, um, I would say, recruited by the enemy. They have been recruited in order, amen, for them to have private gain and to interfere with what the spirit of God wants to do in his church. And he had me, he gave me their names, even as we've been fasting and praying monthly, all right, monthly in the house of in the Gideon Warren. He gave me their names, but he doesn't, he usually refrains me from speaking. But in this year, he said to me that this year he will begin to release certain names. And I began to release the names that he gave me. Again, in this vision, he gave me names. In this dreams, he gave me names and he showed me those that are standing. Amen. But he's also began to speak specifically about his individual judgments over certain ministers of God who are rejecting and refusing to repent. And so the Lord has sent me with this word, not to bring out your names at this time, but for you to understand he knows you, he has seen you, and he's about to do and to carry out what he has spoken and the judgments over you if there is not a swift repentance. Okay, in Jesus' name. So this is the last calling. It's the last warning that the Lord is trying to reach out to pastors in America and United Kingdom. Now, by pastors, he's talking about the ministers of God in the fivefold office. The people of God who have been sent by the Lord and have been given an office, which is a responsibility of Christ to be able to shepherd his sheep, to equip, according to Ephesians 4.11, Amen. The saints for the work of the ministry and to raise them up and to develop them until we all grow into the fullness of the measure of the stature of Christ. Okay. So if you're a, a prophet, an apostle, if you're a prophet, if you're an evangelist, if you're a pastor, if you're a teacher, once you are ordained into that office, or once you're even speaking to the body as if you are in that office, that's another thing. Some people have not been ordained into that office, but they have ordained themselves into those offices. They have sent themselves, okay? They are speaking um, the language or the lingo of those who have been appointed to teach, but they have not. Now, remember, James 3.1 says that the teachers are going to receive a stricter judgment. This is why the Spirit of God wants me to focus, okay, as an apostle, to focus on those in leadership. However, to reach you as well, who are also the Christian believer in Jesus' name. So I asked the Lord, why was it necessary for me to call names? Because I teach um, those of you that um, have been with us for a while or have been in any of the ministries, the two shall be one, getting Warren um, or Union City Church, you know that I teach people that dishonor is something that the Lord does not permit in his house, Okay. So I asked the Lord, why would you want me to call names? And then he began to show me Jeremiah and Ezekiel. And he said, the reason why is because they've been doing it publicly and he's already, he's already be, um, reached out to them and spoken to them. My voice was the voice of confirmation. I am not the first person to say to them what I'm saying. The Spirit of God has already sent people to them privately. However, publicly, they're walking in a spirit of deception and a spirit of error. And because they are gaining from it, they are refusing, all right? And because they're with people who are endorsing it, they are refusing to repent. But his eyes have seen behind the veil. And so because of that, he wants them to know that if someone like me who doesn't know them is able to come and speak against what they're doing, know that God has seen them. God has seen you. Secondly, he said to me, you must be willing as an apostle, not only to teach and to preach and to establish people in the word of God, you must be willing to advocate for what is written in the word and for what the Lord is saying and doing. But the Bible also says we must contend for the truth. We must contend for the truth. So at the same time, once you're an apostle or a prophet, or once you're a pastor, evangelist, and a teacher, you must be willing to defend and bold enough to contend against error and to defend the peace of the sheep. This is the heart of David. The heart of David was not just there to worship God. He was willing to fight the, the wolves. He was willing to fight the bears. He was willing to fight the lions to protect the sheep. And the Bible tells us that uh, the apostles in the first church, they began to come against error. They came against Ananias. They came against the Pharaohs. Why? They were not doing it out of hatred for them. They were doing it to protect the foundation of the body of Christ, to protect the purity of the gospel that had been handed down to them. And so this is part of the responsibility of a shepherd. This is part of the responsibility of the, of, of the 
pastor, a pastorate is to defend and to protect. If you're not willing to defend and to protect with your life, what you've been called to minister or to guard over, we have no business seeking out people. We have no business seeking out God's people. And we have no business ministering if we're not willing to defend them when we see error, if we're not willing sometimes to offend people in order not to offend God, okay? We have no business. We have no business. And so that was all part of the teaching that the Lord kind of impressed upon my spirit as he was preparing me last year and brought me into this year. So now, a few days back, after all these scriptures were given, the Spirit of God brought me back to Jeremiah 12. And I just want to read it to you. Um, okay, let me do it here. Jeremiah 12. I'm going to just open up and read some of them to you now. Jeremiah 12 from 7 to 10. Just bear with me. Jeremiah 12, 7 to 10. It says here, I have forsaken my house. I have left my heritage. I have given the dearly beloved of my soul into the hand of her enemies. My heritage is to me like a lion in the forest. It cries out against me. Therefore, I have hated it. And he emphasized it. I have hated it. Okay. My heritage or my inheritance is to me like a speckled vulture. The vultures all around are against her. Come, assemble all the beasts of the field. Bring them to devour. Then verse 10 says, many shepherds, rulers, pastors in the King James. Many pastors have destroyed my vineyard. They have trodden down my portion underfoot. They have made my pleasant portion a desolate wilderness. Amen. Ezekiel 34. It's a very long passage taken from verse 1 all the way down to verse 24. But in the first and second chapter, so in the first to the fourth chapter, it says, and the word of the Lord Ezekiel 34, from verse 1 to 4, it says, And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God to the shepherds, Woe to the shepherds of Israel who feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? You eat the fat and clothe yourselves with the wool. You slaughter the fatlings, but you do not feed the flock. The weak you have not strengthened. Nor have you healed those who were sick, nor bound up the broken, nor bought back what was driven away, nor sought what was lost. But with force and cruelty, you have ruled them. And verse 5 said that they were scattered and there was no shepherd and they became food for all the beasts of the field where they were scattered. So it begins to talk about what happened to the sheep. And then from verse 11, God, the true shepherd or Jesus, the true shepherd said, Indeed, I will search for my sheep, amen, and seek them out. Verse 12, as the shepherd seeks out his flock on the day he's among his scattered sheep, so I will seek out my sheep and deliver them from all the places where they were scattered on a cloudy and dark day. One of the, um, one of the scriptures, Ezekiel 34, that God gave me in, in sending me out from the two shall be one was Ezekiel 34. And it began to show me that. The consequence of shepherds not standing, not teaching, not preaching, not ministering to, and not feeding the sheep with the correct substance, with the correct food, with a balanced diet. If many people are no, no longer know the Lord, and also many people are scattered from their assignment, they're scattered in union, they're scattered in family, they're scattered from their assignment, they're scattered from the people and the places and the plan of God. And so the purposes of God are being frustrated. They're scattered, you know, um, through pride. They're scattered through disobedience. They're scattered in many ways. And the Spirit of God began to show me it is as a consequence of the state of the pastorate. And this is the reason why he was sending me. He brought me back and said, now is the time that he's going to execute many of these judgments. So when you read down from verse 11, you read down to verse, to verse 16 and to verse uh, 17. It says, I will seek what was lost and bring back what was driven away, bind up the broken and strengthen what was sick. But I will destroy the fat and the strong. 
and feed them in judgment. I will destroy. Now, one of the things you see, he wants the sheep to be fed. He wants the sheep to become fat, but fat on the truth of the word. According to the book of Malachi, he said that the those who fear his name shall grow out like store shall grow fat like store fed calves. And so the growing fat was not the issue, but growing fat and becoming fat off abusing your position is not permitted. And so he said, I will destroy them and feed them in judgment. This is that time that the Spirit of God is saying, You have pushed him to the wall. And now is the time we're about to see many ministers of God who are guilty of transvening the Lord's counsel, the Lord's will, the Lord's way in the house of God. And he calls it irresponsible shepherds and those that have fouled up his heritage and those that have caused us, ruined his vineyard. This is the time that he's going to feed them in the judgment. Okay. So he continued on to talk about what he would do between sheep and sheep. And he continued on to say what he would do in terms of rehabilitating the sheep. Amen. Establishing a righteous shepherd over them, which is my servant David, which is the symbolism of those who are faithful in Christ. Okay. So having said those scriptures, this is what the spirit of God now began to show me. That's in Ezekiel chapter 34, verse 1 to 20, 24. Many pastors have ruined the portion of the Lord. And because of that, God has no pleasure in his people as he should. God no longer sees the condition of his church as something to be rejoiced over. Yes, there are individuals he rejoices over, but corporately, the Church of America and United Kingdom is a disappointment to God, is a disappointment to God. And he no longer takes pleasure in his church, and also his bride is no longer being prepared. Vitally important. Over the weekend, he gave me two encounters in a dream in one night, and then another encounter in the daytime, and then another encounter, that's four encounters now, last night. They were extremely real. They were extremely vivid. And so the first encounter, we were all in a wedding party and we were all dressed up. I wasn't dressed up as a bride. I was kind of dressed up as, you know, um, a guest to the wedding party. Okay. We were all dressed up and we're in the venue. And in the venue were many ministers of God, as well as many Christian believers. And then my spirit was grieved because even though I was in my gown, I understood the time had run out. I understood that many people were not ready. And so I stood up in my gown and I began to cry out like screaming. When I say screaming, I mean screaming. I was screaming and I was saying, are you ready for the return of Jesus? I was screaming, are you ready for the return of the Lord? I was screaming, listen, ready, Bryce. Jesus is coming any moment. I began to tell them, are you ready? I began to go to people's table and say to them, are you ready? I began to pull my ears and say, are you listening? I remember vividly pulling my ears because this is something that I do to my children. If they're really not listening, I will pull my ears and say, are you listening? Meaning this is serious. Are you listening? Meaning listen to me. Amen. And I began to literally cry out against the ministers of God and say, Jesus is coming for a ready bride. Are you ready? Are you ready? Jesus will not take anyone who is not dressed. Do not deceive yourself. And this is the word to the ministers. Jesus will not take you if you are not in order. And if you have not been part of the people to prepare his people to come into order, he will not take you. He will not accept you. He will not take the fact that you've preached. He will not take the fact you prophesied. He has written it in, in Matthew 7, all right, um, from verse 21, he said, not everyone who calls me Lord, Lord will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my father. And many will come to say, we preach. Many will come to say, we prophesied in your name. And he will say to them, away from me, you who practice iniquity. And so the Lord is saying to you as a pastor, if Jesus is to come now, will you go? Will you be part of those who will be taken? Are you purified? Are you without spots? Are you without wrinkle? And I knew it was so urgent, like in this vision and in the dream, it was literally like we had minutes. We had minutes. It, I knew we did not have hours. I knew we did not have days. We had minutes. 
we have minutes. And so because I have the urgency, there was like a panic in my spirit. And I began to say to them, are you ready for the marriage supper of the land? I began to cock my head and say, listen, I'm not saying this as a preaching. I am saying this for you to wake up. I am saying this for you to understand. Jesus is coming back and he's coming any moment now. Now it tells us in Matthew 25, 13, that you do not know the day or the hour the son of man is coming. Amen. So I kept on telling them, are you listening? Are you listening? Are you listening? And then suddenly, as I was trying to break down to them and I'll break it down to you, I will break down to you how you can know you were ready. Okay. As I began to boldly tell them and, and, and question them, and I began to say, ministers of God, you've got to come up to the scratch. You've got to admit to yourself, you have not done what Jesus has asked. You are not doing what he has asked of you to do. Amen. And as I began to say it, they, they were looking at me and I said to them, I know I'm ready. I said, if Jesus comes now, I know I'm ready. And I kept on saying it. And I was amazed because even though I was saying it, I was watching myself say it. Amen. And even as I was saying, I know I'm ready. It came to me how I knew I was ready. And I'll explain that to you. Amen. I said to them, I know I'm ready. So stop making it a mystery. It is not a mystery. Everybody is supposed to know when they're ready. Everybody's supposed to know when they're in the state. It is not supposed to be a mystery. And that alone is grieving God that you're making it a mystery. You're making it like nobody can call you out. You're making it like nobody can point fingers. You're making it out. It's not love for people to call your name. And God said, no, it is not biblical. There are times whereby we shouldn't call names to bring division. But there are times whereby the Lord will send the prophets and the Lord will say, go to so-and-so and tell them they must repent. Amen. And the Lord was saying, it should not be a mystery. Why are you making it a mystery? It should not be a mystery. And I began to challenge them. I know I'm ready, not because I'm more holier than thou, but because I know, because there is a condition that you are supposed to know as a minister of God. You are supposed to know what a ready bride looks like. You were supposed to know how people are, are, are judged or qualified to be ready for the coming of the Lord. And you're supposed to have shown it to your sheep. And you yourself are supposed to have prepared yourself. Amen. So that's how I now woke up. And I woke up in a panic. I woke up in a panic. And as I was meditating about it, I had to write everything down, which I did. Okay. The Lord now brought to, to my memory. He brought to my memory the fact that the day after... I had remarried my husband after 11 years divorce. The day after that, as we, as I was thanking God on my knees in my bedroom, the spirit of God said to me, I am happy you're restored, but now that you're ready for Jesus, stay ready and stay prepared. And I said it and I told people in the ministry that this is what the Lord has said. He said, now you are ready, stay ready and stay prepared. And so he let me know at that stage that even though I thought I was ready as a minister of God, I was not. Because there's certain criteria and there's certain things God expects of you in order to call yourself ready. Okay? So I knew at that point that many pastors, as he brought it back to my memory, are not ready at all. You are not ready. Don't deceive yourself that you're ready based on these criteria. Then I went to sleep. And they went into the next dream. And in the next dream, because I was asking the Lord, why is it that when I began preaching, I was preaching to everyone. And then he emphasized the pastors. Why does he keep emphasizing? And the spirit of God as well was signing it off. This is the Holy Spirit. He was signing it off. So I knew this word was coming from the Holy Spirit. He made it clear. This is me, the Holy Spirit speaking. Amen. He made it clear that everything I was going through was by his hand. He made it clear for some reason. He wanted me to know it was not the father. It was not the son. It was the spirit. Okay. This is the Holy Spirit. He signed it off even before I woke up. He signed it. This is the Holy Spirit. Amen. So I knew it was him. And I kept on asking, so why are you emphasizing pastors? Why don't you emphasize the body of Christ? Amen. And so th there were very many people there, Christian believers and pastors. And so I was, at the next part, the Holy Spirit led me in the next vision, which was like a dream vision. Okay. It's very difficult to tell because you're kind of in sleep, but you're awake. <laughs> you're in sleep, but you're awake. So it's like an open vision, but at the same time, you're in a sleep stage. Okay. That was the state I was in. It's like a trance. So the Holy Spirit led me to um, two well-known public ministers. 
and for for this time he's not permitted me to mention their names but they were very very concerned and they've been praying over the youth and they kept on telling me and i was praying and as i was praying i came across them in the same situation and they too were praying but in different places and so we all joined up we all joined up and we were all concerned with one thing our young people our young people, and we discussed the danger they were in and what the system was about to do to the young people. And so we began to discuss it and we began to talk about how, you know, we could pray and how we could help the young people. And then they needed, and how much they needed leaders to show them the way, but there were not enough. There were very few. So that was one of the reasons the Spirit of God gave me in that the young people are coming under attack. And the young people are going to come under greater attack. But the enemy has already put things in place in the system, in United Kingdom and America, to completely destroy the faith and the identity of young people. We think it's bad. It's going to get worse. It's going to get worse. And he wants to destroy their destiny. He wants to destroy their peace. He wants to remove the foundation. And God is saying, if we don't get right first, it will affect them. That was the, the second part. Then I woke up again. Amen. And so I took notes. I took notes of that. Then the third part, he now began to explain to me why the pastors. So when I woke up, the spirit of God said to me, the message is for now. The message is not for later. It is for now. He began to let me know that the urgency, because I said, God, how will I minister this in our church? Because we've just started literally. How will I minister this? And I was meditating about it until last night. And then last night, a huge storm came, but somehow the storm came into my dream. And in the dream, it was very, very violent storm. And the Spirit of God showed me in the dream, you cannot go to the church. I need you to do it online. I don't want you to go to the church and do it. I want you to do it online. I want you to do it online. And so that's when I woke up and I literally had to message and say, please do not come to the church today. We're going to do it online. Okay. And it made it clear to me that the storm has already begun. And when I woke up, there was a violent storm in the natural that was going on, even though in my dream and in the spiritual, it was also there. And then he began to let me understand about why the pastors, pastors of United States of America, pastors in the UK, those of you in the fivefold office, you cannot lead your people, says the Lord, where you've refused to go. You cannot lead people where you've not refused for the Lord, for the Spirit of God to lead you. Number one. Number two, pastors, the Spirit of God says, you cannot successfully prepare people for the return of Christ if you are not prepared. Number three, the Spirit of God says, pastors, you cannot be bold and you are not bold to speak on issues and matters publicly because you're contravening them privately. And because you're no longer walking in the light, you don't have boldness to call things out of the darkness. And you're trying to cover it up by saying people shouldn't call you out. But the Spirit of God says, if you were walking in the light, you will be able to stand as Apostle Peter. You'll be able to stand as Apostle Paul. You'll be able to stand as Ezekiel. You'll be able to stand as Jeremiah and call things out of the darkness. And the reason why you can't call them out is not because you're lo more loving. It's not because you're more merciful. It is because you know you're contravening them privately. Okay? And so this is what the Spirit of God is saying to you. He says you're not bold to speak on these issues because you know you're contravening them. Because anyone who's walking in the light, anyone who's walking with the Lord Jesus Christ, even when the three Hebrew boys were called to bow down, they were bold to deny. They were bold to say no. They were bold to refrain and say, King, we will not bow. So it says the fact that you're not able to publicly denounce and publicly speak and publicly preach about things, it is a testament against what you're doing privately, says God. The Lord is speaking in terms of unintentional and persistent sin in your life. He's not talking about the general sin that people fall into. He's specifically emphasizing the intentional sin and the intentional unfaithfulness that you know you're walking in and you are refused to hear when the Spirit of God has been calling you out. You have refused to hear those that maybe don't have a name or those that maybe have been sent to you privately or things that God has sent to you in private or things that the Spirit of God has already highlighted. You have refused used to hear so god is raising up this world to let you know you do not decide pastors and i've written this down when and how to prepare the sheep god does 
The Lord is saying you're out of alignment. You are out of strike. You are out of season. You are out of time because you have not prepared yourself and neither have you got the capacity, therefore, to prepare his sheep. Amen? So in ignoring his pleas, you have become a Jonah in his house. And he took me to Jonah. And he said, what happened in the time of Jonah? Jonah basically was costing the lives and was costing the ship of many people. Jonah was a man who was called of God. Jonah was a man who heard the voice of God. But Jonah was a man walking in disobedience. Jonah was a man walking in pride. And the Lord is saying for many of you pastors, you are a Jonah in the house of God. You hear his voice. You know his will. He has spoken to you, but you're walking contrary to what he has shown you because it doesn't pay or because it doesn't prosper you or because it's not in agreement with what you have agreed with or it's not in agreement with the network or with the people of God or with the with the um the the, the ones that you yourself have th those who have endorsed you and so God is saying because of these things you have now become a Jonah in his house and it is costing the house it is costing the people everyone who was on the ship with Jonah nearly lost their life and there's a word for you all to understand that for those of you who are Christians, you must pray for your leader because what's going to happen now in the next few weeks and months is going to destabilize not only the leaders, it will destabilize those under their influence. And so the Lord is saying it is important that we cry out and ask the Lord to deliver them and ask the Lord to convict them. Because if they don't turn, then what's going to happen is they will have to be turned over into the sea. They will have to be turned over into the world. And the Lord is going to remove his covering. The Lord is going to remove his cover. He's going to remove, amen. He's going to expose what is going on. According to Ephesians 5 and verse 16, it says, do not have fellowship with any unrighteous works, amen, of darkness, but rather what expose them or any unfruitful works of darkness, but expose them. And the spirit of God began to show me Ichabod. He began to show me Ichabod. I'm going to talk to you about how you will know you're already bright in a minute. He began to say Ichabod in 1 Samuel 4.21, amen, was given that the glory has departed. It means the glory has departed. But God is saying in the same way as he did to Eli and his regime, he's about to do to the pastors and the ministers in our regime. The same way Ichabod, amen, departed. The same way there was darkness over the earth when Jesus died, because Jesus is the manifest glory of God, is the same way there is darkness that has come in daytime over this season. There is darkness. And he said the April 8th eclipse that took place in America was just a signal, was just a sign that darkness has overtaken the daytime in the house of God. Darkness has overtaken the daytime in America and in the United Kingdom. It is just a signal that for a few minutes, the sun is supposed to shine brighter than the moon. But for a few minutes, darkness taking over in the daytime. In the same way, in the house of God, the Lord is saying it is a signal of the state of the season that for the next few weeks and months, the Lord intentionally is allowing Ichabod. He's allowing Ichabod for darkness to intentionally overtake the light, for darkness to intentionally shut down the light, for darkness to intentionally expose what is going on, amen, and he's doing it in order to remove the cover and in order to sit down or to remove the unrighteous regime, the unholy regime who have stopped and who have, who have refused to repent. This is it, Ichabod. Ichabod did not happen by the hand of Satan or by the hand of the devil. Ichabod happened by the permission of God. Jesus died at the will of God. Samuel was raised up and Eli died by the will of God. Likewise, many ministers and pastors, the Lord is saying, Ichabod is happening in the church in American United Kingdom and he will remove some of you, your life by the will of God, not by Satan. For others, he will sit you down by the will of God, not by Satan. For others, he will take you to the place, amen, like Jonah, where you need to cry out. He will provoke repentance by what he puts you into, where no man, no woman can get you out of. By the will of God. This is urgent, ministers of God. This is urgent, pastors of America. This is urgent, pastors and ministers of the United Kingdom. Amen. The Lord is saying you cannot ignore his pleas. You will no longer ignore his cries because you've become a Jonah in his house and you're costing not only yourselves and your family, you're costing his church, his family, and you're costing many souls in the world and he will not permit it. So to save them, he must deal with you. To save them, he must judge you. To save them, he must expose you. This is what he's saying. This is what he's saying. So what are the four things 
or one of the four ways you can know you're already bright for the coming of Jesus Christ. Number one, you look for. Your heart posture should be a heart that you look for and you hasten the coming of God. Number two, you live for. Number three, you prepare yourself for. Number four, you prepare people for. These are the four ways scripturally. For the sake of time, I cannot read out every scripture, but these are the four ways scripturally that you know you're already bride. Number one, you look for. The Bible says looking for and hastening the coming of God. The Bible says that you look for the coming of the revelation of Jesus Christ. You look for. This is in 2 Peter 3, 11 to 13. You look for. If you're not looking for his coming, you are not ready. And the spirit and the bride say, come. You must be looking for him. You must be praying for him. You must be reading the sign of the times. If you're not looking for, you are not ready. You're not ready. Because when you're looking for somebody coming, you prepare. The second thing is you live for. You live for. Again, Second Peter chapter 2, from 11 to, um, where is it? 11 to to 15, praise God, 11 to 15, it talks about what manner of people should you be, but those who are living holy conduct without spot, without blame in the world. So you look for and you live for, you prepare yourself for, and you prepare people for. Titus 2, 13, 1 Corinthians 1, 7, Romans 5, 1 to 7, it starts off by saying, therefore be imitators of God as dear children. It continues to tell us how to walk in the light, how to walk in wisdom, how to redeem time, amen, and how to walk in oneness in our family, which is walking in humility. That was the bit the Spirit of God brought out to me. He said, many people, number one, are not walking in love. They're not walking in the light. They're not walking in wisdom. They're not redeeming the time. So if you're not doing it, you're not teaching others to do the same thing. Simple, okay? But then he says, walk in James 4, 7, in humility. Why? Because only in relationships and in your family, in your assignments, is humility truly revealed. That is why he said to me, after I had restored my relationship with my husband, now you are ready. So he's saying for many of you, the state of your life, number one, the state of your heart, but the state of your family is testifying against you. And the state of the family of God is testifying against you. The fact that in humility, when you, when you read what they say, they say, submit to God, resist the devil. Why has the church not been able to resist the devil? Because we are not submitted to God in the area of humility. And humility is best judged in union, in relationship, in marriages, in family, in church. That is how you can judge. You can judge. So when you read Ephesians chapter 5, you will see that Paul broke it down. He broke it down about the time and the season. He broke it down about the conduct, but then he also broke it down in terms of marriage. He broke it down about husbands. He broke it down about wives. He broke it down first and foremost that each one needs to walk in the fear of God, submitting to one another in the fear of God in Ephesians 5.21, okay? He broke it down about children obeying parents in Ephesians 6. And then he talks about the full armor of God. So the Lord was saying that we want to jump to the full armor of God, but we have not been found worthy or we have not qualified ourselves in the area of humility. Humility is tested in relationship. Humility is tested in how we relate to each other, not just to God. Humility is tested in how we relate in terms of um, in the house of God and also in our own families, husbands, wives, children. Okay. So the Lord is saying humility. Humility. So because of that, imitate me as I imitate Christ. First Corinthians 11, 1 Corinthians 11.1 is where he's saying you've been tested and found wanting. Humility. Because anyone that's resisting to hear the will of the Lord and to hear his heart cry or to hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches is walking in pride. It's walking in pride. And 1 Corinthians 10 tells us what former generations were practicing as an abomination. And it says it was given to us as an admonition upon whom the end of the age has come. And the Lord is saying the things that he himself caused many to fall by. He said, take heed those who stand lest you fall. In 1 Corinthians 10, in 1 Corinthians 10, take heed from 12 to 13, 12 to 14. Let him who stands take heed lest he falls. It's written. It's also written that God is faithful, that will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation makes a way of escape. 
So the Spirit of God is saying, for these reasons is why he has judged. For these reasons is why he is saying an urgent word to pastors and America and the United Kingdom that you are not ready. Number one, you're not looking for. Number two, you're not living for. It is written in 1 Peter 1 16, I am holy, therefore be holy. If you are not living holy, you are definitely not teaching holy. Number three, prepare yourself for. Number four, prepare others for. And so when you read the book of First Peter, you read the book of Second Peter, you read the book of Romans, you read the book of Corinthians, First and Second Corinthians, you can see what are the criteria of the ready bride. And he's saying once you do not fall in that criteria, you are not ready. You are not ready. There are other things as well. When the Bible tells us that those that beat the sheep or do not feed the sheep, amen, when the Lord comes, will receive many stripes. In Luke 12, Verse 47, it says, that servant that knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself. That servant who knows his master's will, but prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. Luke 12, 47. And so you are of those, says the Lord, that you are those that know the master's will, but you're preparing not yourself, nor are you walking according to the word of God. Therefore, he shall beat you with many stripes at his coming. Unless there is repentance. Unless there is repentance. Jeremiah 3.15, he says he will give us pastors who, she, sorry, talks about pastors who feed the sheep with knowledge and understanding. The pastoral office, the office of the fivefold is to feed sheep with knowledge and understanding of who God is of his expectation and of the season and the time that they're in, what they must do to be saved. If that is not your focus for them to be ready, if you cannot vouch for the sheep that they are ready for the coming of the Lord, they are ready for the marriage supper of the Lamb, you are not ready, neither have you prepared them. First Peter 5, 2-4 says, Shepherd the flock of God, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, not being lords over them, but being an example to them. And then it tells the young people to humble themselves. And then it tells all of us to clothe ourselves in humility. And so based on all of these words, the Spirit of God began to show me that he's not pleased with the pastors of America and United Kingdom. And there has to be a very, very swift and there has to be a uh, deep repentance. He's no longer saying this is a word for the next two, three months. I'm telling you in the spirit, I know it's days and weeks. I know. I know. John 12, 25 to 36. Jesus started preparing his disciples. In fact, I should say, let me just go from 35 to 36. Jesus started preparing his disciples. And as he prepared his disciples, Judas was among them. And this is where the Spirit of God brought me to. And he said, just like I was on my way to the cross, I, as the glory of God, was laying my life down. But that was a sort of Ichabod. The glory was departing through the cross. And so he began to prepare his disciples emotionally. He began to prepare them by speaking to them after he had raised Lazarus from the dead. John 12, from verse 35 to 36. Jesus started preparing his disciples, and this is what he said, and this is what the Lord is saying to the ministers. Then Jesus said to them, John 12, 35 to 36, a little while longer, the light is with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. He who walks in darkness does not know where he's going. While you have the light, believe in the light that you may become sons of light. These things Jesus spoke and departed and was hidden from them. The Spirit of God is saying the same to the pastor. He's saying your light is so dim that it's about to be snuffed out. But for those who have ears to hear, while you have the light, before the full measure of Ichabod hits the house of God, walk in the light. While you have the light, believe in the light that you may become sons of light because it's only those who are sons of light who are going to survive these days of darkness while you have the light okay and then he hid himself from them we read in john 13 2 
And it says that when Jesus was washing the feet and preparing the disciples, it says, he said, I've washed you with the word, but I'm now just washing your feet. Otherwise, you have no part in me. So he was basically consecrating the last of them, including their journey to Christ. But Judas, because of what he had decided to do, the Bible says in John 13 too, the devil put it into the heart of Judas to betray Jesus. By the time Jesus broke bread one last time with Jesus, in John 13, 27, Satan entered him. What am I saying? The Spirit of God is saying that many of you are just at the point Judas was at. There is a point of no return. So God is saying, if you're a Jonah, you need to turn now. Because if not, the enemy will push you and plant you and things into your heart that will make you a Judas. And a Judas is a person there is no return. He doesn't want you to get to the point of no return. You see that when Judas got to the point of no return, Jesus left him. But the difference between Jonah and Judas is that Jonah was put in a circumstance that nearly killed him. But through the mercy of God, he cried out to God, he repented, and God restored him. So the Lord is saying to the church, for many of your pastors, they are a Jonah. And if you do not pray and ask the Lord to convict them, many of them will transition into a Judas. When they get to the point of being a Judas, there is no return. The Lord knows they will go into perdition forever. But for those who can still be saved, my prayer is, and the prayer of the church, is that many Jonas will, through what God puts them into, because they will suffer loss. They will suffer loss of name. Many of them will suffer in terms of their personal life. Many of them will suffer in terms of what God will allow them to go through for the sake of saving them. He will allow them to go through hard times, harsh times. They will be put in places and through experiences that no living person can get them out of. But when they cry out to God, he will deliver them on the understanding they will honor him. On the understanding, the original assignment that was given them, they will be faithful to it. On the understanding that they will not go back to their old ways. This is what the Lord is saying. There is no way back. There is no way out but repentance. You repent now as a Jonah. You will be all you'll be handed over. But if you go from a Jonah into a Judas, you will be left to your own destruction, says the Lord. This is what the Spirit of God himself has given me several encounters about. And as I read the word, he told me, do not eat. I just want you to hear what I'm saying and then minister my word as I give it. Ichabod shall happen. Ichabod is being forced. Ichabod has already started. The glory of God has departed. But it is so that he can judge the pastorate. It is so that he can cleanse the false from the pure. It is so that he can allow you time to see. There is no more time. Amen. It is so that those who are following him will not forfeit what he has spoken over them. And it is so that the world and the nations can hear the truth of the gospel of Christ without pollution. Amen. And receive the power that was needed in order for the witness of the gospel and of the Lord Jesus Christ. The resurrection of Jesus Christ. The days of darkness are already upon us. And the Lord is saying, before the remaining light in you is snuffed out and you enter into deeper darkness or betray the Lord to your own destruction, turn now. And it says, Judas went out at night. So the Spirit of God ended by saying, the Judas went out at night, never to return, and went to his demise. He's saying, the ready bride, the groom, also came at night. So for many husbands and marriages, the conviction coming upon men and women is going to happen in this season. It's a very short season. It's a very short season. It's going to happen in these few weeks and months. Amen. As we end the year 5784, it's going to happen. At night, the transactions will take place. At night, the conviction will take place. But at night, the betrayal will take place. At night, the unions will take place. At night, marriages will take place. At night, conviction will take place. Whatever it is for you, it is going to happen in this night season. God has given this night season not to destroy the church, but to cleanse the church. 
to cleanse the church. It is happening in America. It is happening in UK. And God himself is putting out the light. I've underlined it, of the unrepentant. He's putting out the light of the compromising and the complacent, beginning with the pastors, beginning with the leaders. Then his judgment will turn to the enemies of the world. And by the time he's finished, if you read First Samuel chapter 6, you will see the ark returned, which stands for the glory of God returned, but it returned to a new people. It returned to a people who were repentant. It will turn to the people who are upright. It returned to the Samuels who took the place of the Eli's. And so there are Samuels God has already prepared to take the place of the Eli's. And like I said, he desires to use the Jonas, but it's, it's, it depends on you. If you want to perish through the destruction you go through, or if you want to cry out to God and be restored, it depends on you. It depends on you. Days and weeks left is the final part of this message which includes what do you do? Days and weeks left. The Spirit of God had me shouting in my dream. The Spirit of God had me sweating because I knew that what has to be done should be done by June or before. I knew it. It's a knowing in my spirit. He said June has been marked as Pride Month. He's already told us that in the month of June, every repentant family, Every repentant individual and family must be on their face in humility. He said, you generation thinks they can overcome pride in the same spirit. If we do not humble ourselves, he is expecting every man, woman, and child to repent and ask God, what aspect of pride does God want to get rid of? And, it, and I said to him, do we do it in May? He said, no, you do it in June. You do it in June. And he said, and when I see the repentant ones, my fire will fall. When I see the stubborn ones, stubborn ones, my judgment will fall. And so you've got days. You've got weeks to decide. Okay? Before, on or before June. It was a strong sense, but already the instruction came. And then when I woke up, he reminded me, I've already given you the instruction for June. He's not even given me the instruction of the fast for May, but he's already given me the instruction of the fast for June. Okay? Based on what is called Pride Month. So what do we do now? If my people that are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, I will hear and turn from their wicked ways. I will hear from heaven and I will hear their land. That is what the word tells us. Second Chronicles 7.14. What do you do now? Number one. As a Christian, pray for your pastors and pray for the leaders and pray that they hear this word, pray that they heed. Pray that the Spirit of God will speak to them in the language they understand and they will heed. Number two, pastors, in James 4, 7 to 10, it tells us that submit to God, resist the devil. It says you shall cleanse your heart and your hands. Oh, sinners, let me just open it. This is the drastic action. This is not, I'm thinking about it. This is not, I'm praying about it. The Lord is saying, you will not stop what he's about to do unless he sees action, okay? So James 4, 7 to 10, it says, therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. If you say you're not going through it, if you say you're not going to fast, you're not going to pray, you're not going to repent, the judgment will fall, okay? Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, meaning your works, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. He will lift you up. Amen? Praise God. So this is what the pastors must do and every leader and every believer that hears this word. The Lord is saying, number three, like Jonah, if you know you're with ministers of God who are refusing to repent, if you know you are with people or in churches or in ministries that you know are no longer walking the narrow path that has been ascribed to us or prescribed for us in scripture, he's saying, do not cover them. This is the instruction of God. Do not cover them. So what do you do? Simply separate yourself from the unrepentant. Because with the persistently unfaithful, the Lord is saying, you will go down with them. If you stick with the Jonah, you go down with Jonah. There was no way out for those who were in the ship with Jonah. 
Either they have to go into the sea or Jonah does. Now, how do you put somebody in the sea? You don't. But you separate yourself and the storm, the wind that God sends, puts them in the sea. The Lord is saying this, this to the believers. Many of you know, I knew when my pastor derailed. And when the Lord revealed it to me after many years, because I knew it, he said, you have to get down out of the church. You can give any excuse you want. But the Lord told me, you have to go. You have to separate. So I'm warning you, Christians, you that know what's going on behind the scenes, if you stay, you stay for your own destruction. Because when the storms come, when the wind comes, the Bible says the Lord sent a contrary wind. And this contrary wind is not Satan. You will not survive it. You will go down with them. So the Lord is giving you time to get down and get out. He will speak to you about it, but I believe many of you have heard already. But you think to yourself because they're known. You think to yourself because you've got money. I was being paid from the church. I have been in that church for 14 years. And the Lord came to me and said, you get down without any pay. You get down and take nothing. You get down and they didn't give me anything. No severance pay, nothing. Nothing. So understand the Lord did it to save me, save my family, save my children and save my destiny. And I'm restored back today in my marriage because I listened to the Holy Spirit. And I did not listen to what was popular. This is how important it is. God is not joking with any of us. This season we're in is something that we have not seen before. So don't take it for granted. It will bypass you. It will not. It nearly cost the lives of those on the ship. Their efforts were neutralized, were made of no effect because of the presence of the one who was in compromise, complacency, and of disobedience. And he took my mind to Acts chapter 27. He said there was a storm that threatened the life of many people in the days of Paul. But everybody was saved because of the presence of Paul, who was the obedient one. Even though Paul was a slave at that time, they put him in prison. Because he was God's man in obedience, everyone was saved. Versus Jonah, that if you stay on Jonah's ship, you will go down with him. You will go down. You will go down. So separate yourselves from the Jonas. Separate yourselves from the compromise. Separate, the Bible says with the immoral, sexual immoral, don't even eat. And yet we overlook it. Separate yourself for your own sake and pray that the Lord will put them in the place to provoke repentance. Praise God. And then number four, he brought my mind to the ministers of, of the UK who are in network with ministers in America or in the US. The Lord says you have to disconnect and renounce your membership. Disconnect. If you were serious about your repentance, disconnect and renounce your membership of places and people and networks. UK ministers in networks with US ministers. When you know that the foundation of what is being practiced is not pleasing to God, neither is it acceptable. Neither are they preparing, okay, the people of God for the, com for the coming of the Lord. They have already been disapproved of scripturally, according to Jeremiah 12, um, 7 to 10, and Ezekiel 34, 1 to 24. When you know that, and God has shown you that, he doesn't expect you to just say, I withdraw. He said, withdraw your membership. God wants to see who you are affiliated with. He wants to see who you truly are in alliance with. He wants to see how deep repentant you are. That is the four things that he's given me to tell you. Four actions. Number one, pray for your pastors. Number two, the pastors themselves, the leaders, must take drastic action according to James 4, 7 to 10 in cleansing, in purifying, in drawing near to God, in humbling themselves, in submitting to God, resisting the devil. Number three, like Jonah, you must separate yourself from every Jonah, minister, um, leader, church. And number four, you must renounce and withdraw your membership from places that God has spoken to you about who are no longer walking with him or fulfilling his will and his mission. May the Lord bless this word in Jesus' name. That's the word of the Lord. Urgently, 
to pastors in America and United Kingdom. Amen. Praise God. So thank you so much for hearing the word of the Lord. I trust that you'll be able to share it, but know that it is vitally important that as many ministers of God who may be walking the tightrope between Jonah and Judas receive this word. And my prayer is they will receive it, not reject it, because we're about to see a lot of turmoil. We also pray, and this I didn't write it down, but it really is inferred for the covering of the saints of God. Because many, in the knowledge of what they've heard, because they've been socialized into not taking action against their ministers, unfortunately, many of them may stay put. But I know that the Lord is going to judge everyone according to their knowledge of things, according to the knowledge of what you have, according to what you know of the Lord, and according to what you know of his ways and of what's going on. That's the true measurement of how the Lord judges matters. And so when somebody is a child of God or a lamb, as I call them, they're not dealt with with the same severity as a son who's not dealt with as the same severity as an elder. But know that the spirit of God is saying, when you know something is not right and you remain silent or you remain complicit, it will affect you when the final hammer, the ax comes to the root of the tree. So it is up to everyone to encourage everyone to walk uprightly before God and also to seek cover, okay? In the will of God, away from these wolves in sheep clothing. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. God bless you.